looking at me on this camera. My name is Dwight. Uh, this is my amazing girlfriend, Maya. Uh, we're going to welcome, welcome you guys uh, this evening on this beautiful, sunny, and windy. It's kind of cloudy, but it's amazing weather. It's fall season, my favorite season of the entire seasons. Uh, and we want to share our scripture with you guys in Hebrews, even though we're going through the book of Hebrews. It's, it's kind of on, uh, pretty cool that we're, we chose a scripture in Hebrews, and it's Hebrews 13, verse 8. It says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And I don't know about you guys, but me, I'm wrestling right now. Uh, there's so much stuff going on, uh, so many different conflicts going on in the world that are making our average, normal, everyday lives unnormal. Uh, there's so many things going on in our country today. There's a lot of injustices. Uh, there's um, a whole bunch of politics, the political things that are going on. Political war is what it really seems like uh, right now. Um, and, and it's all interesting because all of this is happening in the middle of a pandemic, you know, and, and that is just causing us uh, to, to be uneasy. You know, our lives are changed dramatically. I don't know about you guys, but I work from home like all the time. I would much rather prefer to be in the field doing things, uh, interacting with people. But all of my work is sitting in front of a laptop for like eight hours a day. And uh, that's just dragging to me. But no, what's interesting is that I have a God that stays the same regardless of what's going on around me. And I think that's something that I've been really fighting to hold on to is that, you know, my Jesus, my Lord is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen. And now I'm gonna let Maya share. <laughs> Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, it's good to see you guys' faces and to semi be back to normal a little bit um, being at church. But yeah, I really like this scripture because I think it just reminds me um, just of who God is. Okay. And I think it's so easy to look at our current circumstances and to feel hopeless or to feel confused or to feel right. angry. But um, just to remember that um, even though these outward things are always changing and might hurt us, God will never do those things. He's constant. He's good today, yesterday, and forever, and I think that just really encourages me, and I hope that being here at church, we can remind each other of who God is, um, and that, um, yeah, we can be constant because we rely on Him. So, hope you enjoy the service. Come on, Maya. Come on, Maya. Uh, all right, for that, uh, I'm going to pray for the service. Come on, brother. Uh, Father God, I just want to thank you for bringing us all together here, uh, whether we're on Zoom or whether we're in person, God. We're just super grateful that uh, we have something to, to come together for it, God. Uh, in, in such a world and in, in, with things that are going on, uh, it's so easy to be separated, God, but you are the glue that brings us together and you're the glue that holds us together, God. And I just pray that uh, we can grasp onto that, Dad. And, and I just want to pray that you can speak through Ed uh, just as uh, he uh, uh, preaches today uh, through the book of Hebrews uh, and, and that our minds can be uh, enthralled just by who you are and what you do for us, God. Uh, Lord, I love you and I thank you. And as all this that I pray in your son's gracious holy name, amen. Amen. No, we haven't seen it. Okay, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna sing, uh, sing hallelujah to the Lord. All right. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living. Jesus is living. 
Jesus is living in his church. Now Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back to claim his own. Jing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lord. Yeah, that's done. How's it going, guys? Good. Come on, brother. Happy Saturday. It is a beautiful day out. And it is one of the first days in a while I've been pumped to be outside. Um, my name is Reese Holland, and uh, I am helping lead the team ministry in the Norfolk region. And uh, I'm going to be sharing contribution with you guys today. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and go to 1 Timothy 6. Make sure I'm there. Uh, so, as the church has been going through Hebrews, I've been going through Hebrews as well. And uh, one thing that's been coming up a lot is this idea of hope. And uh, that's kind of what I was thinking about as I was uh, going through contribution. So I'm going to go ahead and read 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse... 17 it says as for the rich in this present age charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on god who richly provides us with everything to enjoy they are to do good to be rich in good works to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Um, and I think, you know, P Paul's writing this uh, as a message to a young church leader to um, help him, you know, give him courage to, to call people to be generous and to uh, question uh, what people are putting their hope in. Uh, and I think as, as Americans, even though that there's a lot of crazy stuff going on, I think we are extremely fortunate. Um, God has blessed us uh, tremendously uh, and a lot of us, even those that may be struggling financially a bit more compared to the rest of the world, we are certainly blessed uh, financially. And I think as a result of that, it's so easy for us to put our hope in finances. Um, I know for me, uh, especially having since been married, I've been thinking a lot more about 401ks and property and, and different stuff like that. Stuff that in college, you know, I was not concerned about. Um, and it's easy to be obsessed with finding comfort and uh, to, to really build security uh, in, in our worldly possessions. And uh, Paul really points out the flaw in that, uh, which is that there's uncertainty in these things. Um, and I think the times that we're in right now have proven that more than anything else. Uh, a lot of people have lost jobs. A lot of people, their finances have been stretched uh, because of all the coronavirus stuff and other stuff as well. And uh, the, the, the wonderful thing here is Paul points uh, these people that are finding their security in finances back to where we should find our security 
and where we should find our hope, which is in God. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so this, this passage, it calls us to be generous. It calls us to, to have, have great works and uh, to, to give freely. And I think uh, the, the, NIV, the NIV translation of this is interesting. Uh, in this last part in verse 19, it says, uh, it says, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And uh, the NIV talks about uh, instead of having life, having truly life. And uh, I think that's so profound because when we do put our security in God and put our hope in God instead of our worldly possessions, it's so incredibly, uh, it, it's, it's such a difference in the way we live our lives. You're free. You're not constantly worrying about things. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to be free in that way. Uh, so why hold back what we're giving to God? Uh, God has given us so much, and it doesn't make sense for us to trust the gift more than the giver. Um, so as, uh, as I'm about to pray for contribution, uh, just take some time and examine uh, where you place your hope. And, and don't give out of compulsion or guilt or anything like that, but truly examine where am I putting my hope. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. Uh, just for a really wonderful and beautiful day, God. I pray that you can just uh, really soften our hearts, God, uh, so that we can truly see and understand the, the beautiful sacrifice that you've given for us, God, uh, and so that we don't withhold any part of ourselves from you. Um, whether that is, you know, in the way we conduct ourselves and what we do, or whether that is uh, with our finances, God. I pray that we can just give ourselves wholly to you, God. Um, I pray this all in your son's name. Amen. And then quickly, uh, for contribution, uh, we're not going to be handing out like baskets or anything. So the church, you can give to it via Venmo or via the church website. And with that, oh. we, are, we are making our way through Hebrews. My first chance to preach on Hebrews. And oh my goodness, what a passage we have in front of us. This is one of those passages that uh, does cause us to be sober-minded. There are five of those in the book of Hebrews. They all make us all stop in our tracks and recognize that we are being given direction from God here that we are to take real serious heed. And we'll look at that in just a moment. But before I jump into that, you, you probably have all been familiar with the kind of colloquialism, folk saying of, of a frog in a kettle. Right? You, you, guys, you guys know the, the, uh, the, the metaphor there? It, the idea is, is that if you want to cook a frog, and who doesn't, right? Uh, if you want to cook a frog, you don't put them into a pot of boiling water, because if you try to drop a frog into a pot of boiling water, unlike a lobster that will go down and scream, the, the frog has the ability to leap back out of that pot of boiling water. So you can't put them supposedly in this pot of boiling water. Uh, we do have a, a kitchen here and I'm gonna invite you to come in in just a moment to, to see what I'm talking about. So anyway, so we have this, this pot of, but you don't put them in a pot, of, what do you put them in? You put them in just a, a nice warm bath, right? A comfortable bath of warm water and then once the frog is acclimated, turn up the temperature a little bit. As the frog acclimates, turn up the temperature a little bit more. If you're cooking multiple frogs, they're kind of all enjoying themselves. After a while, as you turn up the temperature a little bit more, they might be saying to each other, does it smell like chicken in here to you? It smells like chicken. I smell chicken. What is that? What is that smell? Anyway, but, but ultimately, supposedly, that's how you ultimately bring about the demise of your pet frog, which will now be your main course, or at least your, your appetizer, uh, is to slowly, gradually acclimate, acclimate, acclimate until it is past the tipping point, and suddenly you will then know as well that frog legs kind of taste like chicken. <laughs> but, but I guess that's the way that, that you can bring that about. Um, you know, it's the same thing in our spiritual life. 
Uh, if, 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 if someone kind of came in the door to you and, and uh, he had a scar on his face and he invited you into his criminal operation of selling cocaine in South Florida uh, and, and you know, promised you a, a million dollars guaranteed right off the bat, uh, you would say, yo, Tony Montana, I, I, I'm, I'm not going into business with you, right? Why? Because it's just so stark. But what if, what if there was a gray area where, where, where suddenly, you know what, go ahead and put it on your expense report. It seems like everybody else in the company has put this on their expense report. And why not get reimbursed for that $75? Seems like everybody else is. Why, why shouldn't you? If, if you've been kind of eating that as a personal expense. And, and again, you, your, your conscience never allowed you there. But all of a sudden, because it's become commonplace among others and, and everybody's looking the other way, suddenly that's your entry into the kettle, into the comfortable water. Uh, and then, then it's just a matter of degrees at that point. You know, brothers... If, if suddenly a woman kind of came walking across your path as you're sitting at a restaurant and, and she was dressed just awfully provocatively uh, and immodest at every turn and was really bold and brash in her overtures, I think you would reckon, whoa, no, 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 this, this, this is an immoral proposition that is being paraded in front of me right now. But what if she's cute and fairly nice? And on top of that, she laughs at everything you say. Well, that should be an indicator right there for most of you. <laughs> that there is something of demonic origin that would allow that to happen in your life. But, but nonetheless, if if that's the entry point, well then suddenly you find yourself in a dance that you never would have entered into otherwise. And this is the warning that we encounter today. So let's go ahead and turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. All right, starting in verse 1, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore. I think the NIV changed that in the most recent update to, to say the most careful attention. The reason being is they recognize that in Greek there was, a, there was a diminished ability to give a superlative, right? You know what a superlative is. That's the you know, senior superlatives, right? I'm sure Anna was most artistic in her in her uh, high school class, right? So, probably no. I don't know. She did an amazing painting, by the way, for me the other day. It was really anyway. But anyway, uh, a superlative is is not better. It's best in this case, right? So it's this idea of being the ultimate in something. We we recognize that this was the attempt of the original uh, author's words is to give us a new high water mark, a new superlative. And what is the superlative? In our intensity of attention that we give to the message of Jesus. That's what we're being called to. And, and by the way, as you sit here right now, if you're open to the Holy Spirit really working on you through the inspired word of God, know that you sit here not just to kind of check the box of a, of a Saturday, Sunday service, but, but rather... You sit here about to receive a charge scripturally from the Holy Spirit to hit a new high water mark in your intensity of attention to the word of God. You know, often as we do these lessons, we ask, hey, I have two thoughts in mind here. The two are so obvious today. By the way, they are, in what ways might I drift? And in what ways might I hit a new high water mark in giving attention to Jesus? How, how might I drift and how can I have a new personal best in my love and intensity with the word of God? So be, be thinking about that 
and thinking about how, how is that really going to come home for me as I spend this time engaged in the Word of God right now. Okay, we must pay most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. And that, that word literally means drift away. It is, it is you on an inner tube on a lazy river making your way down and going at such a nice little slow rate that you have become, it's imperceptible of where you were and where you are just a few minutes later. And before you know it, you are out of sight. So since the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. In other words, God did a whole lot of cool stuff so that you pick up this and you realize I'm not just picking up any other book right now. What I've got in, in my hands right here is something that ought to make my knees knock as I open it up and realize, am I ready for this? Am I ready to process words from God that are expected to have an impact on my mortal soul, helping me in some way to come in touch with divinity as I interact with this gift from God, that God would care so deeply about us as mortals that he would endeavor through all sorts of creative ways in the past, through angels and prophets and all sorts of means and various methods to try to get through to these creatures that he loves. And now he's like, all right, that didn't work, obviously. What have I got? Ah, my son, my son whom I love. I'm going to send them a love message and write them a love letter that cannot be ignored. And on top of that, in case they don't necessarily get it and they don't appreciate the depth to which I have disrupted their lives with my desire for real intimacy with them, I'm going to take all the words and all of the principles and I'm going to attest to them like over and over and over again just by ordinary messengers with like crazy miracles that are going to cause your jaw to drop just in case they begin to kind of fade from their original love and passion that they had for, for what it is that I gave to them in this message. But nonetheless, it is, it is always a, a tendency to drift away. I, I mean, th think about some of the, the things that are kind of cool where we live here in Hampton Roads, right? We've got Jamestown, we've got Yorktown, we've got Williamsburg, we've got the ocean front, we've got the naval base, we've got these carriers that you can, all of those things are, whoa, this is so amazing. But typically, you don't ever go to them unless what happens? Unless somebody from out of town is visiting you. And I started like, like, you know what? I guess I got to figure out how to get on the Nautilus because I've never done it. And I've lived here a really long time. Or maybe I did it 22 years ago. And, uh, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. And even with something like Jesus, it's very easy to be like, wow, so enthralled. When he brings that initial disruption, when he... The scales fall from your right. It, it, it's all passion all the time. But even something of that massive magnitude, as much as you think, no, 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 I'll never, I'll never wane in my, my wonder of Jesus. Well, apparently we can because that's why it's here. But, but let's think about this for a second. What are some ways that we can wane? And, and it's very easy to be overly convicted on this sort of stuff, by the way. Um, you know, oh, you know, I can say, oh, how's your prayer life, right? How many minutes a day do you pray now versus when you were first kind of coming to know Jesus? Sure, all of those things, right? I, I, could, I could go through a litany of those things. And I don't know if that is actually so helpful to be technical of whether you've really begun to drift away. But, but I think take any of those measures, any of the things that, that are the normal expression 
of being in a love cycle with Jesus, right? He pours it onto you, he brings it to you, and you're grat gr grateful, you overflow with generosity, you express it back, the dance continues, it's all wonderful. How do you know that the, that the Tokyo Drift is really the case go going on in your life? Well, it, it, it could be that your sense of wonder has no longer the edge that it had before. It's not as though like, oh my goodness, what I'm going to find in the Word of God today. I, I pray Psalm 119 whenever I open the Bible. It's, it's kind of a little tradition. And it's, oh Lord, open my eyes so I may see wonderful things in your law. And that helps me so very, very much, by the way. Why? Because like everybody, diminishing marginal returns just happen. Right? Of course, the first time ever that I ate coffee, toffee, Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Oh my goodness. It's like new light came to my eyes. The goosebumps up and down my eyes. Like, what is this magnificence that has just passed over my lips and tongue? Oh my God, how can I deepen this experience? You know, I mean, but that was the first time, but you know, it's, it, it's no longer like, let me get dressed up because I'm about to eat Ben and Jerry's anymore, right? That's, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe, maybe, you know what, maybe I'll try something else. I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe with whipped cream. It might be, right? Anything, any sensation at some point loses the initial impact. It's just the way that we're built. But this one's too important to just kind of let it fade away. And so we are called to look at different and creative and wonderful ways to keep appreciating how great this salvation is that has been delivered to us. But, but, but let's talk about this, this drifting away. I, I would say it's not just, oh, my Bible study's less, my evangelism's less, my sense of duty is greater than my sense of delight, my, my prayer life is, sure, all, all of those things, they wax and wane. Sometimes you have good seasons, sometimes you have bad seasons. But if it has become a fairly consistent bad season in any of those things, and you've not talked about it with someone, then I would say, that's a drift. That you've suddenly been, oh, it has become acclimated to you that this is all right, and it shouldn't even be something where I want to connect with somebody to help really just jostle me again so that I can get a bit of a course correction and enjoy, enjoy new vistas, enjoy new insights into all things Jesus Christ. But it, it also shows itself, I think, in how, how we really do deal with things like sin, though. I mean, that's obviously part of the author's real intent here is that if, if we allow ourselves to go down a path that has a life of transgression, a life of iniquity, and we start to become okay with that, ugh, then we really need to be scared there. And it's, it's not the fact that sin did happen in our lives, but the fact that it no longer has any sort of an alarm. And, and it could also be that the, the idea of living in the light and continually allowing the kind of the antiseptic of sunshine into your soul by being real and being transparent with spiritual people in your life. The, the, the idea of that is no longer even necessary because you've acclimated and you've now become comfortable with a, a certain level of gossip, a certain level of materialism, a, a certain level of bitterness that just kind of settles in there. Maybe you feel like, you know, with this bitterness, I, I have control over this other person in my life. I get that it's unforgiveness, but it's weird. But by me keeping her or him in the doghouse, uh, I'm, I'm actually in an advantageous position. Whoa, whoa. I mean, that, that'll be our fifth of, of five exhortations in the book of Hebrews. Let no bitter root grow up among us. We'll, we'll, we'll have, but any of these areas, right? But, but as guys, you know, especially like we begin to invite all of the darkness of lust into our lives and, and, it, and it goes on without alarm, without abating, without disruption, 
with fellowship or connection in some way or another. Wow. If we're not going to God before him in, in prayer before these things, then yes, you know what? Sign yourself up. Sign me up for drifting. And I'm full on drifting the way that this passage is talking about. And this passage doesn't talk about it as like, oh, well, you know what? Let's, let's course correct, guys. Come on. Not, not, not so cool. Uh, no, no. This is a very sobering way that it is talked about. If, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? What's he comparing that to? The Old Testament, where it says, The message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. Whoa, that's, that's pretty intense. Samuel Johnson once said, Nothing focuses the mind so much as the prospect of being hanged in the morning. Right? The, the idea of consequence, the idea of punishment actually has an intrinsic value there. Not, not just that, well, society will be rid of someone if they're hanged, but no, more, more importantly, any sort of healthy fear of the Lord, not an unhealthy fear of the Lord, not a dysfunctional relationship that is based in fear, but a recognition that, well, I'm not trifling with Jesus in these matters. Again, all of that, they, those are circuit breakers for our life that, that keep us from heading down that path of drifting. But just, I, I think, take a bit of stock. We're now more than six months deep into our new COVID life. And, and maybe it's the Lord's will that we're hitting this at just this time in our life. Who knows? I feel like it is for me, by the way. Thank you, God, that I have had to uh, wrangle right now, right here at this stage of my life, in this new reality with this idea that am I drifting away? And to have a sober assessment, to do a ruthless inventory of, of how you're doing and to see is there a drift that is going on in my life? And allow the soberness of the fear of the Lord, allow the grandeur of the love of the Lord, allow God's heart cry desire to want you back, deeply wanting you back. Allow all of that to be the disruptor so that the keep on keeping on of hanging in that kettle, even though the heat is going up and up, will not be the course for any single person here today or here today. Please, I beg you, is do this ruthless inventory. And if you want to absolutely blow it up, and not allow Satan, the flesh, or the world to now be your tour guide into the next steps of your life. If you want to throw that, that compatriot off of you and instead be yoked with Jesus again, just come into the light. That's the beauty of it. Just come into the light. Talk with someone about where that drift is. There's no shame waiting for you. There's only deliverance and beauty and forgiveness and a course correction, a course correction towards glory. How cool is that? So, so let's talk for a second then before we uh, break into communion about how can we pay the most careful attention. So this is actually calling us to a personal best. Personal record right here. This is not glory days are behind you. This is your glory days are ahead of you right now. Somebody's nodding because he just had a personal best today. But anyway, <laughs> but I got a lunch out of it. Amen. Um, personal best. Think about a time where you paid most careful attention to the message of Jesus, to the life of Jesus. You know, when you do, there's amazing results that occur when you pay careful attention to Jesus. Have you ever had someone in your life that was just so far beyond you? So much more kind, maybe more confident, more patient, better listener, noble, wise, gentle, sober-minded, holy. Have you ever had somebody like that in your, in your life? I've had more than a few people, praise God, like that in my life because I set a low bar. But a as those people have been in my life, you know, I think of Jim Blau. He was a, a friend of mine. We were in Washington, D.C. together. And we would be in these kind of gatherings, fellowship, 
And I would watch Jim. And I would just be floored. Because as I, I saw in him an ability to make people feel loved just by the way he gave himself completely as a caring listener to them. But it, at first, it, it was at first inspiring, and then it became deeply convicting because I thought of how very different I am than Jim Blau. And, and then, more than convicting, it actually became embarrassing as well. And then ultimately, through that embarrassment, came ultimately hope because I realized that as, as I watched him, and as I was, was really kind of soaking it in, and because I began to study it. I couldn't help but then begin to study it. And, and as I began to look and gaze, that goodness began to pass into me. I began to realize, wow, there is a way to do this. This is not an impossible evolution of, of someone's character. It, it, it's already here. And, and suddenly, I aspired and actually took steps, baby steps, to be a little bit more like Jim. One of the reasons when I was uh, first dating Deb that I just was floored was that unlike any other person that I knew, she was holy in an unholy world. And, and I mean holy. And, and amazingly, and she made holiness look good. But, but it was just so easy. And no matter what we talked about, whether it was pop culture or shopping or e even um, kind of little, little funny anecdotes, no matter what it was, she processed it through a Jesus filter and really wanted to understand it with an otherworldliness, a kingdom view rather than a world view. And, and I'm, I had same same experience that I had with Jim Blau, I, I was having with Deb. And I, and I thought, wow, this is the woman I want to gaze upon for the rest of my life for a variety of reasons. And not only was it quite pleasant to the eyes as I gazed upon Deb, but, but also as I did, I realized maybe, just maybe, some of that Jesus is passing into me as well. And we're called to pay more careful attention, to really set our sights on Jesus. Personal best here. But, you know, you, you could try to gaze upon God, but it seemed like, whoa, Moses was told to stay in a cleft of a rock, and maybe once you get by, you'll, you'll get a little bit of a snapshot of it, but not, not full-blown God here. Because, I mean, try, try contemplating the sun, just some small portion of God's creation. And, and here we're told in this passage that Jesus is the exact, right, back in verse, uh, chapter 1, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That in Jesus, we have the ability to just simply take God in in a way that is not overwhelming and accessible to every one of us. We can take God in. Just, just as much as you know, you, you want to like just study your favorite athlete, right? Study your favorite YouTube makeup artist. I don't know how these things are. I'm trying to be all things and failing miserably. I get that. Right. But 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 you know, and suddenly some of that stuff does pass through. Praise God. But we want it to be God in our lives, and, and so we get Jesus. Amen. We get Jesus. So humble, so winsome, so beautiful, so accessible, so inviting, so gentle, so firm, so holy. And we get to contemplate Jesus. I want to encourage you. Make these next 90 days, as we go from, from here to the kind of the Christmas season, make these a personal best for you contemplating, paying the most careful attention to Jesus, to Jesus, his words, his person, his character, his love, 
his desire for relationship with you, his desire for you to be invited into a yoke and work and walk along with him. Make this your personal best. But if it's going to be a personal best and we're serious about it, there's a simple thing that allows that to happen. You know what that is? Shirking off individualism and doing Christianity the way the Bible calls us to do Christianity and it's to do it together. That, that we connect one with another. That we make a, a 90 day intentionality from here to the end of this year that as, as we make our way through with the book of Hebrews that, that we have a real connection in the word of God. This Tuesday night Instead of having a women's midweek and then the next men's midweek, we're going to all meet together only on Zoom. So this Tuesday night, we're going to come together and we're going to lay out real plans, 90-day reading plans, 90-day study plans, 90-day discussion plans, where we can get after a communal intentionality of a personal best that we can all look back at the end of 2020 and say, that's stinking 2020. But... <laughs> Except for that personal bang. I've got a home in heaven, all right? You ready? <laughs> I've got a home. I've got a home. I've got a crown. I've got a crown. I've got a love. I've got a love. That won't let me down. Won't let me down. And I've got a home. I've got a prize. He'll wipe away the tears from my eyes. In heaven, in heaven, I've got a home in heaven. In heaven, in heaven, don't you know I got a home in heaven? I've got a home, got a home forever, to stay. forever to stay. I've been forgiven, I've been forgiven. And, I'm on my way. and I'm on my way. Cause I've got a home, I've got, a home. I've got his grace. I've got his grace. I see my Lord. Face to face. face to face. Come on, in heaven, in heaven. I've got a home in heaven. Don't you know? I've got a home. I've got a home in heaven. As I've got a home. Seven with me. I've got a home. I once was lost. I've found me, sorry. Jesus, he found me. His blood on the cross. His blood on the cross. Cause I've got a home. I've got a home. That I get to share. That I get to share. I've got a promise. Oh, and I see you there. I see you there. In heaven, in heaven. I've got a home in there. Don't you know that I've got a home? I've got a home in heaven, in heaven, in heaven. You know I've got a home in heaven, in heaven. I've got a home in heaven. I've got a home in heaven. I've got a home in heaven.